so you don't have this. I'll just ask a few questions of you, or, or you ch we'll check our knowledge of what we know so far about encryption. So I'll state something up here, and, and in doing this, we'll get some review of the terminology or the notation that we use with encryption. So you have a, a sheet that lists the a set of assumptions we're making. So that's what we want to arrive at. Let's go through some cases and try and answer what is known or what is assumed when something happens. So I'll show you what happens and then we'll, we'll discuss what's the outcome. So the first case let's say that X, so this is what happens at the start, X, some user X, or we could call them X, they have some plain text P1, they encrypt it and they send it they send the ciphertext C1, which is the output of the encryption, to Y. All right, so X sends a message to Y. So how was it? C1, the ciphertext, the first ciphertext obtained. The notation we use E is the function, the encrypt function. And it could be a different, it could be DES, AES. There are many different algorithms here, but we say it's some encryption function. It takes two inputs, the plain text, P, Right, we'll see that there are different plain texts as we go through, so P1, and it takes a key as input. What, what does KXY mean? What do you understand? So when I have the quiz, maybe an in-class quiz next lecture, or a Moodle quiz, what, does, what would KXY mean? How do you interpret that? It's a key, K for key, and the XY probably suggests that this is a shared secret key known by both X and Y. Right? So this is the notation we'll commonly use. So this suggests we're using symmetric key encryption. So I say the function E, the encrypt function, but we now know there are two types of encryption, symmetric key encryption, where we both sides use the same key, and public key encryption, where we encrypt with one key and decrypt with another. We'll use different notation to identify secret keys, K, and later public and private keys, PU and PR, just so it's clear. So here we use symmetric key encryption. We send the ciphertext to Y. What happens? Well, let's consider what if some inter intercepts that ciphertext, Z, Another user intercepts the ciphertext and they try to do this operation. What happens? What can we assume or what, what, what do we know if they try to do that operation? Um, yep. They're trying to change the key. They're trying to change the key. Well, not necessarily change the key, but you've noticed they use it. What's different here? Right, so E means encrypt, D means decrypt. So we, we intercepted, so when now we're Z, we intercepted the ciphertext, C1, and I try to decrypt it. All right, so maybe I'm trying to do an attack and discover the plain text because it was confidential. I want to learn it. What happens when I try to decrypt it? What can we assume happens? What does Z know after we try this? Or what do they not know? They don't know. Right, so with this operation, what's the outcome of this operation? It's wrong. Correct? That is, it, something goes wrong. Why does something go wrong? because the key doesn't match with what was used for encryption. Okay, so that's correct. When Z tries to decrypt the ciphertext, note there's a different key used here. We try to decrypt the ciphertext using KXZ. Because the ciphertext was obtained by encrypting using KXY, then something will go wrong here when we decrypt. And we'll assume that A, 
Z cannot learn the plain text P1. All right, they will not get P1 as output. And the other thing we'll assume is that they will know that it's incorrect uh, decryption or the plain text is not the original one. It will probably produce random output. And from that, we can recognize that we didn't get the plain text. So two things we assume happens here. Z does not learn P1. And Z knows that it doesn't have P1 because the decryption didn't work. We say it returns an error or it returns something that doesn't make sense. Then there are ways to ensure that will be the case. So why doesn't it work? Because the key used to encrypt and decrypt is different. Why did Z use a different key? Because they don't know K, X, Y. If they did, it wouldn't be secret between X and Y. So just highlighting the assumptions that we make when we use symmetric key encryption. Same message was sent. C1 was sent from X to Y. Y receives the message that's from ciphertext. I denote as CR. Right. C1 was sent. CR is received. We don't necessarily know if CR and C1 are the same. They may be, but maybe someone tried to modify them. Let's check. So what Y does is they try to decrypt the received ciphertext using KXY. They do that and they get some plain text they recognize, maybe some English message. What do we know now? What does Y know? He knows the, the key used is the correct key because we got recognizable plain text. We know the decryption worked. It didn't go wrong this time. So some things we know from Y's perspective, we know that we used the correct key because the decryption worked. We know that the output plain text is what X sent. Okay? Because and therefore the, the ciphertext received is what was sent. So the plain text we received is what X sent. It hasn't been modified along the way. If it was modified, it wouldn't decrypt. So because it does decrypt, we assume that the plain text received has not been modified. There's been no attack on it along the way. So we know two things. All right? We know the plain text first. Actually, we obtain the real plain text. We know that the plain text is correct. It hasn't been modified. And the other thing we know is that the key used to encrypt with KXY, what does that tell Y? The key used to encrypt with KXY, what does that tell user Y? It tells Y that the message came from X. The only people in the world that know the key K, X, Y are X and Y. So if user Y receives a message which was encrypted using that key, unless I sent it to myself, then it must have come from the other person, X in this case. And that's authentication. We know where the message came from. Right? So our assumptions on encryption used to, to build up confidentiality and authentication. What if slightly different? Y receives the ciphertext, tries to decrypt. When they decrypt, they get plain text which looks unrecognizable. It's not an English message, it's random bits. What, is, what do we assume now if that was the outcome? Well, something's gone wrong. If we get unrecognizable plain text, then it means that the decrypt did not work. Why can the decrypt not work? Well, the inputs were not matching what was used originally. Either the ciphertext was modified along the way, maybe an attacker tried to change the, the ciphertext between uh, user X sending and user Y receiving, if the ciphertext is modified, then it will not decrypt if we use KXY. Or 
the message was encrypted using a key other than KXY. So if either of the two inputs are incorrect, then it will produce unrecognizable plain text, and Y will detect an attack. Either the ciphertext was modified, or the key used to encrypt was different than KXY, and therefore we know that. So again, that provides authentication. If the attacker does try to modify something, we detect it at the receiver. So that's how we use symmetric key encryption to provide confidentiality. No one can decrypt unless they have the key. And authentication. If someone tries to modify the message, the receiver would detect that modification. If someone tries to send us a message pretending to be X, if they don't have X's key, then the receiver will detect that it came from someone pretending to be X, not X. Questions on symmetric key encryption? We need to understand the basic assumptions so we can move on. No questions? We've spent uh, a couple of lectures on it. Then let's move on to the newer part. What happens here? New plain text, P2. New ciphertext, C2. What's the difference? If I show you the equation at the top in a quiz, what can you tell me about what happened or what was used? What type of algorithm? Don't be shy today. It's, it's very cold, so there's no reason to sleep. You should be awake. What's PU? Public key. So the notation PUX, PU stands for public key. This tells us that the encryption algorithm, E, is different from the previous one. Here we're using public key encryption, or asymmetric key encryption. We're using a different approach. So that's the first thing to recognize. We're using a public key encryption algorithm. We're encrypting the plain text P2 with PUX, and we get C2. So user Y receives C2. What do they know? What does user Y know when they receive C2? All right, they know C2. They received it. Do they know anything else? If so, what? They know the public key of... C2 is the ciphertext. We have X and Y and Z as the users in these examples, so they know the public key of... Okay, we assume that we always know the public key of other people, by definition. Y knows the public key of X because it's public. What else do they know? Or what do they not know and why don't they know it? Do they know P2? Does Y know P2? Someone's nodding their head. Anyone will have a vote. Hands up for yes. Does Y know P2? If you don't put your hands up, then you will get an extra question in the quiz. And I recognize your faces, so I remember your names. Don't worry. All right, two, two options, yes or no. Does Y know P2? Hands up for yes. Does Y not know P2? All right, we have a few people voting, good. Why does Y not know P2? What's your opinion? Why do they not know it? They know C2. What about P2? Anyone can help them? You voted no. Why do they not know P2?
It was sent from X, yes. And it was encrypted by X. Can they decrypt it? Can Y decrypt C2? If they can decrypt it, then they'll find P2, correct? But you said they can't find P2. Now you've explained to me that they can. The question is, can Y decrypt C2? Well, with public key encryption, if C2 was obtained by encrypting using the public key of a user, then it can only be decrypted using the corresponding private key of that same user. C2 was obtained by encrypting using the public key of X. The only way to decrypt that is using the private key of X. PRX, we would denote that. And the private key of X is known by who? Private key of X is known by X. Private means secret, just to X. So Y does not know the private key of X. When Y receives C2, they cannot decrypt because they don't have the private key of X. So in this case, Y does not know P2. Some people voted for that but didn't have the right reasoning for that. It's because to discover P2, you need to have the private key of X, and only X has that. So remember, with public key encryption, if it's encrypted with one key in the pair, say the public key, it can only be decrypted with the other key in the key pair, the private key of the same user. What if X receives C2? Do they know P2? X receives this. Do they know P2? Yes. Why? Because X does not have the private key. Because X has the private key of X. And it's P2 was encrypted with the public key of X. Whoever has the private key of X can decrypt. X has the private key of X, so they can decrypt and learn P2 in this case. Okay, so X knows P2. Y, if they receive, would not know P2. So this provides confidentiality. The way to achieve confidentiality with public key encryption, if you want to send a secret message to someone, you encrypt using their public key. Let's say Z sent this message to X. Z encrypts the message using the public key of X such that only X can, de can decrypt because only X has the private key. So that's the role of public key encryption for confidentiality. It works, in most algorithms, it works the same in, if we use the keys in the opposite direction. If you encrypt with the private key of X, you can only decrypt with the public key of X. So what happens here? Someone encrypted P3 using the private key of X and they obtained C3. What if Y receives C3. What does Y know? Do they know P3? This is, this is logic. There's not much detail of the algorithm we'll go through. It's just some logic if you remember the rules. Why? You're saying no. Why can't they know P3? What do they need to know P3? P3 was encrypted with the private key of X. To decrypt it, to decrypt the ciphertext, what do you need? You need the public key of X. Remember, the keys are in pairs. If you encrypt with one, you can only decrypt with the other. It was encrypted with the private key of X. So if you have the public key of X, you can decrypt. 
Who has the public key of x? Everyone. It's public. So y receives c3, they can decrypt, and they can learn p3 in this case. So yes, they do know p3. There's no confidentiality here. The message is public. We can see what it is. What else do we know? If it successfully decrypts with PUX, what does Y know? And this is an important role of this public key encryption. What does Y know when it decrypts? They know the plain text and who sent it or who created it? It must have been created by X. Because if P3 was encrypted with the private key of X, and then we can successfully decrypt the ciphertext with the public key of X, then that implies that the only person who could have created that message is X. Because the only person in the world that has the private key of X is X. So this is performing some form of authentication. When Y receives C3, they decrypt with the public key of X, they learn P3, but they also learn this message, P3, definitely came from X. No one else could have sent this message because no one else could have encrypted with the private key of X. So that's the role of public key encryption for authentication. Just going back, you see we're using the keys in the opposite order. For confidentiality, encrypt with the destination's public key. For authentication, encrypt with the encrypt with the source's private key. X encrypts the message with their private key. They send it to someone. That person who receives can verify it came from X by decrypting with the public key of X. So we've got two roles of public and... Have I missed one? Maybe I have. Right, there's another one. Y receives C3. What if Z receives C3? Maybe Z's malicious. What can they do? So same equation. Does Z know P3? Yes, they do, because you need the public key of X to know P3, and it's public. So yes, Z knows C3. Can Z verify it came from X? Yes, because if it does decrypt with the public key of X, then it means it was encrypted with the private key of X. So Z also knows it came from X. From Y and Z's perspective, they know the same. Right? So everyone can verify this message. Everyone can see the contents. We can combine the two forms of public key encryption to provide both confidentiality and this authentication. That is, starting on the, the inner part, take our me message, our plain text message, P4, encrypt it with a private key of X. So let's say user X does this. Then the output of that, encrypt all of that with the public key of Y. And we get some ciphertext, C4, and send it to Y. Y receives C4. What do they know? You could work from the outside first, from Y's perspective. To decrypt this, Y needs the private key of Y. All right, Y has that, so they can decrypt the outer layer. Then they can decrypt the inner layer because they need the public key of X to decrypt the inner part, and the public key is known by Y. So they decrypt the inner part. They learn P4, so they, they find out what is the plain text. And they know it came from X because it was encrypted with a private key of X. So this is a way such that Y receives the plain text and they know for sure this message came from X. 
What if an attacker tries to do that? They receive the message. Z, for example. Can they see the plain text? Can Z see the plain text P4? Why not? Z needs the private key of Y to decrypt the outer part. The outer part is encrypted with the public key of Y. Z therefore needs the private key of Y to decrypt and Z doesn't have the private key of Y because it's private just to Y. So Z cannot decrypt the outer part and therefore cannot see the inner part and cannot see the plain text. So we have confidentiality. Other users cannot see the plain text and we have authentication, the user that gets the plain text can verify who sent it. So we can combine the, the, the two modes. Remember how public key encryption is used. And it's quite simple. Encrypt with one key, you can only decrypt with the other key in the pair because we have key pairs. And in both directions. If you encrypt with the public key, you can only decrypt with the private key. And if you encrypt with the private key, you can only decrypt with the public key of the same key pair. And to provide confidentiality, encrypt with the destination's public key. To provide authentication, encrypt with your private key. And this becomes very useful in, in many applications today, public key encryption, especially for signatures. You don't have those slides, but I, the idea was just to think about and to remember those, those rules and then apply them to solve some problems. Any questions before we return to the slides? public key encryption, we have a pair of keys and it's shown here that the rules in, for confidentiality encrypt with the public key of the destination. For authentication encrypt with the private key of the source. That's what we just did and saw. Only the person for confidentiality, only the person who has the private key can decrypt and for authentication we can verify who sent the message using their public key. If it decrypts with PUA, it means it must have been encrypted with PRA, means it must have been sent by A. That's how we apply authentication. And that's about all we want to know about public key cryptography. There are a few more slides. Where is it applied? So where is it useful? Well, we can encrypt messages, but we, for confidentiality we can have secret messages using public key encryption, but in practice it turns out the public key encryption algorithms are generally much slower than the symmetric key encryption algorithms. So if you want to encrypt a large message, you would use a symmetric key en encryption algorithm because public key encryption is generally very slow or much slower. So they both can provide confidentiality but symmetric key encryption is much faster. But public key encryption is very useful for authentication, for signing things, a digital signature. When we only need to encrypt a small amount, the time doesn't matter so much and therefore we can uh, provide a signature when we'll come to a digital signature on the later slides. There are different algorithms. Same with symmetric key encryption. We mentioned some of them. We mentioned AES, DES, triple DES and a list of others on one slide. For public key encryption there are different algorithms. A very popular one, one of the uh, most prominent ones was RSA and still used. RSA is a public key encryption algorithm. But there's some others, and they, they all depend upon solving mathematical problems. 
that is, the security of them depends upon the difficulty in solving some uh, mathematical problems like factoring primes, solving logarithms and so on. And we're not going to go into those algorithms, but they have completely different designs than the symmetric key encryption algorithms. So that we can use one key to encrypt and another key to decrypt. So there are different algorithms. RSA is a common one. We will see in some, uh, you'll see later in some topics mention of things like Diffie-Hellman and maybe elliptic curve cryptography. Primarily used for digital signatures, which we'll cover shortly, and also key exchange, which I'll also, also show an example of. The the design of the algorithms, the requirements of the algorithms, we're not going to cover. There's a few slides on, on the details which we're going to skip over on public key cryptography. RSA, the details of that we'll definitely not cover. So RSA is one popular algorithm. It's not so hard to understand, but we will not cover it in this course. We will see examples of it use using software. So regarding performance, public key cryptography algorithms are generally much slower than symmetric key cryptography. So therefore, when we have a large amount of data or, or time is very important, we would encrypt using symmetric key uh, algorithms. So what role do public key cryptography play? They are very useful for, just for sending secret keys. Let's show an example of that before we summarize the assumptions. Let's say we have our two users. We have, come back to user A and user B. They want to send a lot of data. Uh, a has a lot of data to send to B. And because encrypting with symmetric key cryptography is much faster than public key, we'd like to encrypt this data, gigabytes of data, using a symmetric key algorithm. And an example symmetric key algorithm, just list one of the names, a, a very common one or popular one is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. So that's a specific implementation of symmetric key cryptography. So, to encrypt the data, we need to have a key known by both A and B. Let's say A chooses a secret key, KAB. So, what we're going to do to encrypt the data, encrypt the data using a symmetric key algorithm, in this case called AES, and using the key KAB and send the ciphertext to B and B will decrypt using which key? KAB. How does B know KAB? A chose KAB, chose a random number 256 bits long. How does B know KAB? How does B know those 256 bits? In practice, how do we get this key from A to B. Send it to them. If we send the key to B unencrypted and someone intercepts that, then they can learn the key. So we can't send the key to B unencrypted. B needs the key. A chose one. They haven't met each other before. They're on the other side of the world. They need to send it across a network they can't send it unencrypted because if someone intercepts, they'll learn the secret. So they must encrypt this key. How can they encrypt this key such that they can send it to B? They could encrypt using another symmetric key encryption algorithm, but they would need another key to encrypt with. So what we do is we encrypt the secret key using public key encryption. Let's see how it's, how it's applied. So we have another algorithm that we're going to use, a public key algorithm. And in the example of a popular one is RSA. And with that, every user has their key pair. 
A knows P U A P R A A knows its own key pair they generate their own key pair the public key and private key of A B has a key pair P U B P R B and what else does A know? We'll assume that A knows P U B How does A know PUB? It's public. Maybe they posted it on a, a web page or they sent it in their email, in the signature, every time they send an email. So because it's a public key, it's not so hard to distribute. Right, so the public key of B, we'll assume, is also known by A. Well, there are some, some challenges in distributing the public key. We, someone could try and create a fake public key of B We'll not cover that yet. We'll assume that A knows the real public key of B, that it's not a fake one. We'll see maybe towards the end of the course when we look at web security and digital certificates, some of the ways to overcome getting fake public keys. But when we say a key is public, we assume anyone can know that value. Similar, B knows the public key of A. So that's what's known up front. We need to get key KAB to B. So what we can do is encrypt it. Create some ciphertext. Encrypt using the algorithm, and I'll just write the name here, RSA, the public key algorithm. Encrypt KAB using a public key algorithm to send confidentiality confidentially to B what key will we use to encrypt it to send to B so that no one else can see it which key should we use here you've got four to choose from a has four keys there. Which one is it going to use to encrypt? What do you think? Public key cryptography. For confidentiality, which key do we encrypt with? We encrypt with the public key of the destination. P-U-B. Using the public key of B, We encrypt KAB, the secret value that we chose. We send it. That is, we send the ciphertext to B. And B tries to decrypt. Decrypt the ciphertext C1. What do they try to use as the key? If they think it came from A, What do they use as the key here? It was encrypted with PUB. They are B, they use PRB. They receive a message encrypted with public key encryption. They'll try to decrypt it with their private key. Who knows PRB? Only B. Therefore, only B can decrypt. And that successfully decrypts because the, the corresponding keys in the pair were used for encrypt and decrypt. So we get as an output the original plain text. What was the plain text? KAB. Now B knows KAB. An attacker, if they intercepted the ciphertext, would not be able to decrypt because they don't have PRB. So an attacker would not be able to learn the secret key. 
Now that B knows KAB, the data can be encrypted, or say C2, the second set of ciphertexts, using the symmetric key algorithm. That is sent, and we can decrypt because we also know KAB. And when we decrypt the ciphertext using KAB, we should get the data as output. So here we're combining symmetric key encryption and public key encryption. And the reason is we're using, some, we're using public key encryption to send the secret key from A to B. That is to send KAB from A to B so that no one else can see that secret. And we're using symmetric key encryption to encrypt the data. The reason we use symmetric key encryption to encrypt the data is because it's fast, faster than public key encryption. So when we have a large amount of data, this will be faster than using public key encryption for everything. So that's a very common way to combine the two techniques. That's key, key exchange or key distribution. Any questions on symmetric and public key encryption? To be precise, I should have, when I used the D, the decrypt function, I should have wrote decrypt here with RSA and decrypt D subscript AES, right? I encrypted the key using RSA as the algorithm and I encrypted the data using AES as the algorithm, just as a, a, an example of the different algorithms available. Any questions before we move on to the hard part? We'll introduce some more complexity in a moment. So make sure we're clear on this, otherwise the next part won't make any sense. Okay. All right, no questions. I hope most people have got there. So public key encryption in practice is commonly used for this purpose, key exchange. The, the benefit here is that the key itself is usually quite small, say 256 bits. We only need to encrypt a small amount of data using the slow public key encryption and then we encrypt the large amount of real data using the fast symmetric key encryption. And the benefit is that we can use the public key encryption to exchange the key because the key used to encrypt is known by everyone. This all works on the assumption that A knows the public key of B. If the attacker could make A think it has the public key of B, but in fact it is the public key of Z, then an attack can be successful. A man in the middle attack may be possible. But we'll see that in a later topic when we look at web security. The assumptions about public key encryption are listed here as well as on the other handout. Uh, similar to what we've said along the way, that decrypting with the right key will produce the original plain text and we'll be able to recognize that it's correct. Decrypting with the wrong key, a key from a different key pair or the, the, uh, not the opposing key in the, the correct key pair, will produce the wrong plain text, not the original one, and the decryptor will recognize it's wrong. So these are similar assumptions we've made before. 
let's look at the remaining topics. There are three topics here, key management, digital signatures and random numbers. We're going to just focus on digital signatures. What is key management about? Key management is how to get keys from A to B. We just saw an example of key management. How do we get KAB from A to B? We encrypted with public key cryptography. So that's one form of key management, but there are others. And it becomes issues of uh, using different levels of keys, master keys, session keys, how long to use keys, and so on. We will not discuss key management in depth today. We will look at it when we come up with passwords a little bit and maybe when we return to web security, uh, securing access to websites. We'll go through digital signatures, random numbers. How do you generate a random number? You need to write some software. How do you create a random number in, with your computer? R-A-N-D. You call the function RAND. What if I ask you to implement that function? You don't have a library that already has an implementation. How would you implement this random function? What do you think that function does? When you call RAND, or the random function in your programming language, what do you think it does? Well, there are two basic approaches. One is the, the, the common approach where it just follows some algorithm, maybe does some calculations to generate what, it, what we call a pseudo-random number. Not really random, but close to random. Because a computer cannot follow an algorithm to produce something random. If we follow a deterministic algorithm, we'll produce something that can be predictable. It's deterministic. And that's common, but there are algorithms designed such that the output they produce are close to random, close to, close to truly random. The other way, which is a bit harder to get random numbers, is to, to collect some source or some information from the environment, to measure the, the noise, the background noise from electrical components, to measure key presses and the time between key presses, the time between accessing your hard disk and so on, and all of that information combined exhibits some form of randomness and use that to generate random numbers. The point is, it is not easy to generate random numbers. Secure random numbers are ones that are hard for someone to predict. So there is a lot of study of creating good random numbers in a computer. In this course we will assume that we have some way to generate random numbers. It is important in security and many practical flaws have arisen in random number generators but for, for this topic let's assume that we've got some way to generate what we call cryptographically secure random numbers so we won't cover that in any depth. What we'll do is finish this topic and this lecture today looking at digital signatures. And digital signatures combine public key cryptography, encrypting with a private key, with another thing, and actually we need to go back, hash functions. So we're going to jump back to hash functions to understand digital signatures. What's a hash function? You all know this. You've studied in some early computing course. What's a hash function? What are the properties or the characteristics of a hash function? Or where do you use it? Maybe you studied in data structures or maybe an algorithms course, hash functions. Hash function, a simple way to think of a hash function, it take, a function that takes one input, some message, we'll use it, and it produces usually a small output, and that small output is hopefully or generally considered unique. That is, two different inputs will produce two different unique outputs. We will look at the, the properties of hash functions and then see why they are important with security and digital signatures. So we're going to jump a few slides here. I'll try and get direct to hash functions. Hash functions.
Again, we won't look at specific hash functions. We'll just state the, the assumptions we're going to make and the principles behind them. We say a hash function takes a variable length block of data, m, as input, and the function returns a fixed size hash value, lowercase h denoted there. So the hash function uppercase h here takes a message as input, any length message, and as an output returns a fixed length, usually small, hash value. The hash value is sometimes called a digest or even just a code. We'll often use uppercase h for the hash function, and it's a little bit confusing, the hash value, or the, simply the hash, the lowercase h. Now this function. The idea is that the function is designed such that when you hash different messages, that the output that's produced is effectively random. That is, if you hash two messages which are very similar to each other, the two outputs will be completely different. They'll appear as like random numbers or random sequence of bits. We use hash functions for a number of cryptographic operations. So there are some functions def designed to be especially used for cryptography. We call them cryptographic hash functions. And the functions are designed to meet some uh, in practice some properties that we'll list here. A cryptographic hash function will assume it is computationally infeasible. What does that mean? Infeasible, not possible. Computationally not possible means maybe in theory it's possible, but in practice our computer cannot solve it. We'll come back to that. But basically very hard to find the following. That is, given a hash function, if we know the hash value, so if there's a known h, it should be very hard for someone, given just the value of the hash, to go back and find the original message. Okay, so a hash function takes a message as input and returns a hash value as output. That's normal. A property of that function should be such that if you know the output, you cannot find the input. This is called the one-way property. It should be easy to calculate one way, but not the other. That is, if I know I know the hash function, so the algorithm being used, and I know a message, m, the data I want to hash, then we say it's easy to find the hash value as h of m. That is, we apply the hash function on the message and we get the hash value. So that's normal. We should be easy to do that. But if we know the hash function and we know a hash value, it should be hard, impossible in practice, to find m where the hash of m equals h. That's, what we, that's one of the desired properties of this hash function. If we know the message, we can calculate the hash of that message. Easy. But if we just know a hash value, we cannot go backwards and find the original message. We need a hash function which has this property. And there are hash functions that, in practice, exhibit this property. And this is called the one-way property because it's easy to calculate the function in one direction. The hash of m is easy. But the inverse is hard. We can only go one, one direction. Let me show you an output of a hash function. You want to copy that down? 
a little bit faster. Okay. We'll come back to it. Let's just calculate the hash of some data and, and just illustrate that concept or the, the idea. Uh, I have a message. It wraps around. So that file contains the message. That, that's M. And I'm going to apply a hash function on that and it's going to calculate the hash value for me. There are different hash functions available. Some of them you may have heard of. Does anyone know the name or the, the abbreviation of a hash function? You've, you've probably heard of it somewhere or seen it. MD5 is one hash function. You s may see hash functions used for uh, integrity checks or file checks. MD5 is a hash function. Another popular one is SHA, S-H-A. So MD5 is an older hash function. SHA. Uh, the secure hash algorithm is, is another one, and there are a few others, but we'll mainly use those in examples. So I have some software that will use MD5, and it's sometimes referred to as a checksum for error detection. So the software is called MD5SUM. I'll just note the message uh, is this. It doesn't end with a dollar sign. It's just that there's no new line at the end. MD5 um, will calculate the hash of what's inside the file. So this is applying the hash function. H of the message returns a hash value, and the value is this. Okay, That is a hash value. It's given in hexadecimal. Do you see any pattern in that, those hexadecimal digits? Looks random. And that's the good, the desired property of a hash function. You take some message, which is structured, it will produce a random hash value. And MD5 does that. It's, can someone count them? How many hex digits? It's, I think, equivalent to 128 bits. Thirty-two hex digits. Thirty-two hex digits means times by four. One hex digit is four bits. So thirty-two times four, 128 bits. That's equivalent to. MD5 takes a message as input and produces 128 bits as output always. And in practice, it's a random-looking output. The idea of the one-way property is if I give you this value. Then I ask you, find what the original message is. That's hard to do if you have a secure hash function. It's hard to go backwards. It's easy to calculate the hash, but hard given the hash to find the message. Here's a hash function, a hash value, a hash value. So your challenge, given that, find the original message. I calculated that from hashing a, a small message. And if, if used correctly, secure hash algorithms, it would take you forever with current compute power to find the original message. That is, uh, it would, well, not forever, it would take you too long uh, similar to brute force attacks on ciphers. So a secure hash function means that if I give you this, you will not be able to, in practice, find the original message. You can't go backwards. I know what the original message was. It 
It was simply the word security. Okay, but if you didn't know that, you wouldn't be able to find that, find it. So that's the one-way property. The other property. Two messages, two different messages, M1 and M2, if we apply the hash function on both of them, that it's, well, let's go back. It's hard for someone to find two messages which have the same hash value. Practically impossible that two different messages have the same hash value. And a, a variation of that is if I give you one message, M1, and the hash value, your challenge, go find another message, another message that makes sense in practice, that has the same hash value. <laughs> okay, so a good, a secure hash algorithm will have this property, that it's practically impossible to find two messages with the same hash value. That is, it is collision free. There are no collisions between the hash values. Back to our example, again, message one. I give you this message, and you know the hash value. That's easy to calculate. Your challenge then is find another message, different from this one, that produces the exact same hash value. That's the, the collision-free property, saying that it's practically impossible to do that if you have a secure hash function. You cannot find another message which produces 91D and so on. You could try, that is, you could do like a brute force attack and try many messages, but it would take too long to find it. And similar to that, if you have two different messages, we said we produce random outputs. Is message one and me a message one and message two the same? Message one and message two. Same or different? They're different after please. The full stop is in message one. It's not in message two. So they're slightly different, almost the same. One or two bits different if you look at the binary encoding. The hash function works on the binary form of the message, okay? not, not on the text. So when we calculate the MD5 sum, the MT5 hash of message two, what do you think we'll get? 91D2FE. Applying a hash on different inputs should produce random looking outputs. Even if the two inputs are almost the same, the output should be completely different. There's the hash of message two. Compare the hash of message one and message two. The two inputs are almost the same but the two outputs are effectively random. There's no correlation between those two output hash values. So that's the property also of hash functions. Two different inputs, no matter how small the difference is, will produce two different random output hash values. Now, some algorithms, there are weaknesses such that it's not always true that you can find another message that produces the same hash value. Those algorithms are considered insecure. And MD5 is considered insecure today. So there are other better hash algorithms. SHA has gone through different variations. SHA is called the secure hash algorithm. There's different versions of it. SHA1. SHA-1 is a different algorithm. It produces a hash value, I think it's 160 bits. But there's also SHA with a 256-bit output. And there's SHA-512 and so on. So there are different algorithms. Some are, 
have some weaknesses with respect to security. MD5 is considered insecure. SHA-1 also has some limitations. SHA-2 and beyond are considered secure. But from our perspective, they produce outputs such that given just the output, it's impossible to find the original message, the one-way property. And given one message, it's impossible to find another message, M2, that produces the same hash value, the collision-free property. We'll assume there are hash functions that have those properties. Let's now see how they're used with cryptography. And they're used in different cases, but we'll, use, we'll illustrate them in use for a digital signature. This shows some examples of hash functions used for symmetric key encryption. Mentions that MD5 is one hash algorithm. It generates 128-bit hash. It's no longer considered secure. There are attacks possible. SHA was the uh, newer algorithm, and it's gone through different variations, SHA-1, SHA-2, SHA-3. SHA-1 has some limitations. SHA-2 is considered secure. SHA-3 is, is growing in use. So there are different algorithms. There are different attacks on algorithms. And the attacks involve defeating those properties. If you can go backwards, if you can defeat the one-way property, uh, then that can be used for uh, cryptographic attacks. Or if you can find collisions, then that can be used for attacks. So let's now see how hash functions are used with digital signatures. Uh, let's go direct to signatures. The aim of a digital signature is to prove, to be able to prove to anyone that a message originated from someone or was approved by a particular user. It's a digital form of our handwritten signature. When you sign something, when you sign a piece of paper, the idea is that that acts as evidence that you agree or you approve of that document. You sign it, later someone can see this document has your signature, they can prove that you agreed to that. That's the idea of a signature. We want the same concept for, for data, for uh, digital data. And we'll use public key encryption to do that. We cannot use symmetric key cryptography for digital signatures. If we tried, then there's a potential flaw in it. What we could do is we could encrypt, let's say I want to sign a file. I encrypt that file using symmetric key cryptography and using a shared secret key. And then I want to later prove that it came from a particular user. And the problem with symmetric key cryptography is the key can be known by two people, not just one. To illustrate that, if you obtain this ciphertext and you know it's encrypted with key KAB, that is, it successfully decrypts with key KAB. Who created this ciphertext? Who, which user created this ciphertext? If it successfully decrypts with key KAB, then it cr was created by A or B. Either A or B. We don't know. Right? If it successfully decrypts with K key KAB, it means it was encrypted with a key known by A and B. So we don't know which one created it. With a digital signature, we want to be sure that it's signed by one user. 
We cannot achieve that with symmetric key cryptography because when we encrypt something with key KAB, it could be created by either A or, either, or B. So we do not use symmetric key cryptography here. We use public key cryptography. If this ciphertext successfully decrypts, who created it? If it successfully decrypts with the public key of A, then it means it must have been created by A, because there's only one person in the world that knows the private key of A, user A. So that's the concept we use for a digital signature. But in practice, rather than encrypting the entire plain text to sign it, we use the hash algorithm. So this is the concept. This is the problem with this approach is A or B may have created it. We'll see this in the slides. This one, it means it's only from A. This is the concept of a digital signature or the, the theory behind it. In practice, what we do is that we don't just encrypt the plain text, we encrypt a hash of the plain text. Again, we can prove that only A created it, only A has the private key of A, but it has some practical advantages. Encrypting just the hash of the plain text, what is different from encrypting the entire plain text? Let's say my plain text is a five gigabyte file. In, if I encrypt the entire five gigabyte file, it takes a lot of time. And I need to send the entire encrypted form. If I encrypt a hash of that five gigabyte file, a hash function such as MD5 produces just 160 bits as output. I only need to encrypt those 160 bits. And therefore, it's much faster to encrypt. So in practice, we don't encrypt the entire plain text for a signature. We encrypt the hash of the plain text. And we'll see why that provides the same security. So the concept is shown here. We talk about signing a message. You sign a message by encrypting with your own private key. If I want to sign something, I encrypt with the private key of Steve. Yeah, we encrypt the message with the private key of A. The output of that encryption we refer to as the signature, so I don't know it as S. We can usually send both the original message and the signature if we don't want confidentiality, we'll send the both, the message and the signature. The receiver verifies the signature. They check if it's real. And the way to verify a signature is to decrypt using the public key of the sender. The signature, if it successfully decrypts, then it verifies the message. If not, then we don't trust the message. But in practice, so that's the concept that uh, achieves the security uh, aims. But in practice, the way that we really use digital signatures is that we sign a message by encrypting a hash of that message with our private key. I want to sign a message M. I calculate the hash of that message, encrypt the hash value, the small hash value, fixed size, with my private key. I get the signature as output, and I send both the message and the signature to the other side. And the other side decrypts the signature using the public key of the sender. The signature is decrypted with the public key of A. They get some value as output, and they compare that to the hash of the message received. And if they match, the signature is verified. If they don't match, it fails. Verification fails.
we will look at why or why attacks are unsuccessful on digital signatures and it, we will not cover it today you'll we'll, we'll do some homework to see that I think everyone's uh, has a chance in the quiz to try it but it depends upon the properties of the hash function the fact that the hash function has the one-way property and the collision free property then attacks are not successful on digital signature so that's why we introduced the hash function there there are different algorithms to do the encryption RSA is a common one but there are others LGAMO, DSA and a few others we'll finish with this assumption about digital signatures a digital signature of a message M is the hash of that message encrypted with the private key of the signer or the sender so the signature I'll denote as S and we normally send the message and the signature there's no good just sending the signature we at, like we sign a document we send that document and the signature at the bottom so we send the message with the signature and a receiving entity can verify that message by decrypting with the public key of the sender if it successfully decrypts and the hash values match then it's verified <coughs>